Welcome back to the channel. This is Trady Storm, and you are watching ninth and final part of What if Kid Naruto was denied to be a ninja but still overpowered? If you enjoy this video, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Now, wasting no more time, let's start the story. I should have known something was going to happen because the trip here was so calm. Naruto said to himself as a chakra scalpel from Kabuto Yukushi clanged against his blue rectangular shield on his right forearm. Naruto was on the ground and had his left hand on the ground as he blocked the attack over Yumi Chao's weakened body. Kabuto, who didn't know how good Naruto was at the chakra beam attack, wasn't ready for the four earth fists that came from right under him and hit him on the chin. Naruto's face didn't change as his nails scratched the ground as he clenched his hand. He then dropped his shield and pointed his open left palm at the flying medic ninja. Lightning release. Chakra beam, he said, and a flood of bluish-purple chakra poured from his hand and washed over the silver-haired teen. As the attack went through the ninja, the blonde's mouth twitched down, showing that he was a fake clone. The real one probably switched places with it at the last second. He looked down when he heard a groan and put his hand on the chill leader's shoulder to keep her from moving while his genin team ran to him. Take care of her, he told them. Hi, Sensei, he said as he stood up and started walking towards the sounds of fighting in the forest next to Kumo. Nariko, Barrier Seal, his teacher told him, and the young seal master nodded and unrolled a scroll on the ground. He then slapped his palms together as Naruto ran into the forest and was gone. Fuenjutsu, Seal Barrier. The night before had been pretty quiet. The wave and chill guards kept patrolling their camp in the forest around them. Yugido kept a close eye on Naruto's tent because he could tell he was sleeping but not lying down. Flashback. Naruto sat down with his legs crossed while still wearing the combat uniform he had been wearing that day. He took a deep breath in and then let it out. He then put his hands in the ram hand seal and closed his eyes. He let his chakra flow through the hand seal. He felt like he was falling backwards but he didn't open his eyes. Instead, he just let his consciousness fall back landing softly on lush, green grass in a wide field with black clouds in the sky and a bright red moon. The trees looked pretty normal, except for the one in the middle of the field that was on an island and was made entirely of ink and seals. The boy looked around and instinctively checked to see if his hands and feet still worked. Then he pushed himself up and looked around for the tailed beast that had been locked up. His search didn't take long. The Kyubi ran out from behind a group of trees and stopped close to his jailer. The beast sat on its haunches and cocked its head to the side. Its eyes were blue and red, like a fox's. The beast just rolled his eyes and said, I see the two tails holder got to you, and Naruto nodded and put his hands on his hips. She thinks that I'm weak. Are you? He laughed and said, I don't know, you tell me, even though Kayubi knew him better than he knew himself and was always brutally honest. The beast replied, his tails gently swaying behind him, you're strong for your age. Q-san, that's still not an answer. Kayubi sighed and said, you are strong. The beast grumbled as it stared hard at Naruto, but Naruto was used to it. You are so strong for your age that it's hard to believe. Thank you, Naruto said as he briefly smiled at the behemoth, but that still won't change my mind. I told you that when you're 16, you'll be ready for all of my tales. That's three years too long. I want to be really ready to face anyone who comes against me, and having full control of your chakra would do that." Kayubi asked as he laid his head on the ground and looked at his Jinchuriki, wouldn't sage mode be better than using my chakra? I don't have a summons, he started, but his longtime friend cut him off with a laugh. We both know that you don't need a summons to use sage mode. You've got your chakra high seal. That's sage mode, or at least it's as close to sage mode as non-animal summoners can get. I've already mastered that. Everyone with the seal has mastered it, and when your chakra and mine are combined, there is no limit to what can happen. Like an explosion that could kill every living thing on earth. Or, Naruto said, chakra that is so strong, even stronger than yours and mine together, that people will think twice before attacking not only me but also my allies. Kurama sighed and slowly got to his feet, looking down at the tiny boy. I see I can't change your mind, he said with a frustrated shake of his head. You're just like Kashina. Compliment me later, fight now, and please, as an afterthought. The fox rolled his eyes and said, get ready. With a dangerous snarl. Even though there were dark clouds in the sky, the blood moon lit up the field well enough for Naruto to see the three foxtails that came flying at him. 
This allowed him to jump backwards and spin away from the two that came up from the ground to stab him. A low, almost silent bell rang out across the field, and the landscape changed in a way that most people wouldn't notice. The tree on the island covered itself with a clear dome. The Kyubi's fur stood up, and his once bright red eyes turned dark and evil. His back hunched, and his claws grew longer and sharper than anything Naruto had ever seen, but that didn't stop him. The small dot on the grassy field that looked up defiantly at the beast forced his heart to slow down as he got into the third stage of the armadillo fighting style by getting on the ground like he was about to start running. He also went through some scary changes, like his blonde hair sticking up even when he didn't want it to and his blue eyes getting darker. He shot forward in a roll that kept going, gathering earth around him until he was covered in a rock ball half the size of the beast. Kyubi also shot forward. He hit his head hard on the ball, making a loud cracking noise, but the ball screeched and kept moving forward, like a cart tire. The tailed beast had a huge advantage over Naruto because of his tails and because he knew the basics of some of Naruto's skills. He used two tails to lift the rock and earth ball and another two to stab it. After that, there was silence, and the Kyubi sighed as he slowly pulled out his tails to look at his owner. Better luck next time, he said. Naruto muttered, don't underestimate me, as he crouched on the two tails. A dome of blue chakra kept his shoes from touching the demon's tail. The chakra powerhouse charged up both chakra beam seals in his hands. Purple lightning crackled on his sleeves, and he slammed them down on the tail without hesitation, saying, chakra beam, lightning resonance. The electricity running through the big beast was strong enough to make his bones flash in strange ways and his tails move around wildly. Kayubi yelled and slapped the boy off his tails. Naruto hit the ground, back first from the speed and power, and bounced three times before he got both of his hands under him and flipped five times, each one to slow down the speed he was going at, until he stopped at his feet and skidded backwards, his hands deep in the ground and clawing it to stay in place, making a destructive path of twisted soil and grass as he went. As the nine-tailed beast came at him, the boy licked his lips with excitement. He was angry that his jailer had tricked him. The demon fox opened his mouth wide and started throwing black balls of evil chakra the size of regular people at the person holding him. The leader of the wave quickly stood up straight and hopped away twice while making a long series of hand seals. Wind release. Wind tunnel, he said. Within a second, wind started spinning around him and the beast bullets Kyubi had been shooting at him smashed against the wall mercilessly, cracking at each time, and the beast kept pelting violently towards Naruto. I just need a second, Naruto thought as he put his right hand on the ground. This made the beast stop suddenly, and he growled at his chains, which seemed too strong. Wait, no. Roared the beast, and Naruto, who was still in the breaking wind tunnel, leveled his other hand. The chakra beam seal he had painted on his palm started to glow bright red, and he kept his left palm flat on the ground. The seal merged with itself and changed into something else. Suppress. Kayubi yelled. Dick move, Naruto. That's cheating. As his chakra was forced out of his pores and into the suppression seal on Naruto's palm. Naruto replied, I'm a ninja, deal with it. As he gritted his teeth under the constant pressure of pulling the toxic chakra out of the beast and directing it into the chains that held the Kayubi down. Naruto made the journeyman's chain prison by combining an attack from his chakra beam on the earth with the tailed beast suppression seal. The suppression seal wasn't just any old one that he could use on the six tails. It was one that could only be used on the nine tails, which were the strongest of all tailed beasts. The seal was originally meant to hold him, the Jinchuriki of the nine tailed beast, down if he ever went crazy from the beast's chakra. However, it could also be used to hold down the nine tails themselves. Not forever, of course. Just long enough for Naruto to drain enough chakra from him to make a difference. Using a level 9 suppression seal and his chakra beam, he made a copy of the Uzumaki chakra chains, but it wasn't as good as the original Uzumaki chakra chain. With each influx of Kyubi chakra, the chains grew bigger and stronger, and the Kyubi started to shrink. One by one, his tails turned into short stumps, leaving just five. The beast was now twice as big as a gorilla born and raised in Konoha's forest of death, which was much bigger than a gorilla born anywhere else. The beast used the fact that it had shrunk a lot to get out of the huge chains, which were big enough to hold onto something much bigger than it had become. Naruto let go of the ground as the Kyubi drilled a tail into where he had been, which broke the earth chains that were holding him down. The chakra flowed through the ground and into the chakra pools, including a place for Kyubi's chakra to stay until the fight was over. 
The blonde ninja grunted as the tail grazed his stomach, making a small cut on his side and infecting him with Kyubi's bad chakra. The beast knew Naruto was in trouble by the evil grin he had on his face as he pulled the tail away. The boy coughed and grabbed his side with his left hand. Thin clumps of blood fell out of his mouth and landed on the tangled grassy ground. He fell hard to his knees and coughed again. More blood came out of his lips, and the wound on his side wouldn't close up no matter what he did. When a Jinchuriki and a tailed beast made a deal, like a personal pact, that the holder was ready to take all of the beast's chakra, the fight would be between beast and man, with the man not having any of the benefits of a normal Jinchuriki, not even control of his mindscape. He or she was supposed to fight the beast like a normal person. The big fox beast walked slowly over to Naruto, who was on his knees, and frowned as Naruto coughed again, struggling to breathe with each desperate wheeze and gut-wrenching heck. The wound that had caused all of this now looked like a horrible cut in his side that was slowly eating away at him. In all honesty, the fact that Naruto wasn't writhing around in pain or even whimpering made the fox respect the boy even more. Naruto's shoulders shook as he gasped for air and bled from his mouth in spurts. He could just make out Kyubi's feet in the distance, but they were close enough for the beast to just reach out and crush him. He was hit by a wave of poisonous pain, and he shut his eyes and gasped for air as more air was squeezed out of his body. I told you, kid, you're not ready, grumbled the nine-tailed fox, who was a close friend of his owner. Please don't struggle, he said, but Naruto only coughed and gasped for air in response. His eyes drooped for a moment, and his shoulders sagged. Why why you're? The boy stuttered, mentally crying as the always poisonous tailed beast chakra burned his chakra out of his body. Kayubi's ears perked up to listen to the boy, and he twitched his lips down in a suspicious way. Why you're? His voice was quieter and softer, showing a feeling that Kayubi knew well because he knew his holder better than anyone else. The beast rubbed his tired face with his hand and let the boy talk. You you're staring down at me. He closed his eyes and gave a shrug. I'm sorry, kid better luck next time. He was about to reach out and pull his chakra out of the boy, but Naruto's low laugh, which started as a whisper and turned into a barely audible raspy laugh, stopped him from touching the boy. What's the joke? Even though the beast chakra ate more of his stomach, the boy was still able to answer. KYQ San. You know how I fight, right? He said in a low whisper that only the beast's better hearing could hear. Be better than anyone. His painful stuttering slowed down a lot, and the beast slowly started getting ready to attack, flailing its five tails around. What are you getting at? Naruto wasn't lying. He had been a keen observer in Naruto's life, only saying a few words of encouragement when the boy got lost and steering him away from the path of total depression. Even with all of this going on, he was still a major critic on Naruto's fighting style, comparing it to the ones he knew and helping the Jinchuriki close up any holes that most people wouldn't notice. Every time the young Uzumaki genius made a seal, he was there to watch. Naruto could keep some small secrets from him, but only because he was sleeping or in a noisy part of the forest mindscape. Naruto coughed again, sending blood all over the ground and making him shiver. I've got you, Naruto whispered, and Kayubi's eyes widened in horror as he realized something. The right hand of Naruto was on the floor. Palm open. Naruto whispered as his hand started to glow blue, chakra beam, earth coffin. Kayubi jerked violently away and tried to jump into the air when he heard the familiar jutsu being copied, but it was too late. His back legs and arms were dragged into the ground with force, and when he tried to get away by slamming his last five tails into the ground, the ground swallowed them up as well. Starting from Naruto's right hand, the ground began to crack and shoot towards the buried tailed beast, making a circle of broken earth around the scared beast. All around, there was a violent jolt that even shook trees far away from them, but the chakra control seal tree was safe. The beast rose into the air in a rigid circle of earth that stopped him from moving even a millimeter, and he couldn't get enough chakra fast enough to break it before Naruto finished his attack. Naruto's right hand, which was glowing blue, followed the beast as it rose into the air. The beast had only one eye open, and Naruto was dying from his wounds. He focused his eye on the animals, and as he squeezed his hand, he ground his teeth together. Crush. His ominous voice echoed around the field, and there was a loud, spine-tingling sound of bones breaking as the box of earth chakra folded in on itself with Kayubi still inside. Kayubi screamed in pain as his arms and legs were broken in the wrong direction, twisting and breaking in eight different ways, and his tails were twisted so close together that it felt like they were about to be torn off completely. He hit the ground hard and screamed as his broken limbs hurt horribly. 
Thick red chakra flowed freely from his wounds, pumping from his broken limbs, twisted tails, and broken neck. His eyes were tightly shut as he painstakingly forced his last bit of chakra through his body to straighten himself up. Naruto, on the other hand, was desperately trying to get to his feet as he stumbled towards his longtime friend. He let go of his horrible wound and raised his right fist, making his teeth red with blood and grit. His eyes were wide open as his own chakra spread into the chakra beam seal, which broke open like a flower blooming and changed into a different seal than the suppression seal. Naruto yelled, Uzumaki Judgment Punch. As his fiery fist swirled with violent purple-blue chakra, making it look eerily like an Uzumaki whirlpool. As his fist moved forward, it cracked and groaned, leaving behind a trail of crackling smoke. Then his fist hit the beast's head, making it groan, and a bright white light filled the mindscape. When the flap of Naruto's tent was gently pushed open, he opened his eyes quickly. When he pulled out his last attack, he instinctively looked down at his right arm to see if there was any physical effect. He saw that his long sleeve was being torn, and a light breeze of steam came off his arm. The young leader let out a frustrated sigh, took off his flak jacket and shirt, and rummaged through his bag for another shirt. For a moment, he forgot about the person who had opened his tent flap, even as the masked woman fell to her knees in a typical anbu position of submission. Mole whispered, Na Naruto-sama. As steam rose from her ears and she watched Naruto's back move as he dug for another shirt in his backpack. The boy was surprisingly fit, and it was clear that his clothes were made to hide the lean muscles he had built up through training. When the dark deputy commander looked at his back, she was stunned. It looked like a complicated painting made of flesh and bones, with seal tattoos she had heard high-level seal masters had. The woman had never seen the boy without his shirt on, and she had definitely never seen all of the tattoos of drawings and seals that covered his entire torso and went down his arms, stopping just short of his fingers and collarbone. He usually wore a short-sleeved shirt and shorts with ankle and shin guards. The boy made it a point not to show off his hard-earned body in public or to people he didn't know well because, even though he was already famous and had a body that most people would kill for, he was still an insecure child at heart. The woman's boss hummed and put on another dark blue long-sleeved shirt with black and white stripes that went up to his upper arm. He took off his flak jacket and signaled to the Junin over his shoulder to talk while he went to look for a wheat bar. He gave it to her over his shoulder and started chewing as he listened. We've seen a group of five people heading towards the camp, she said. She quickly grabbed the bar that was offered and put it away for later. Do you know how strong they are? They are keeping their chakra under control too well, and they are still too far away for me to guess what they are doing, sir. When he asked, have you warned your other comrades? He was also talking about the chill Anbu. Yes, sir, but Yumi-sama has already gone to meet the rest of the group. Naruto's eyebrows shot up into his hairline, and he stopped biting. Do you understand? Yumi-sama said she didn't trust them, so she was going to stop them before they got too close to the camp, the woman said in a robotic tone. Nei yugido san chose to stay behind while her guards went with her. The wave leader muttered, well, this is just convenient, as he led the older ninja out of his tent and followed Yugido as she bowed deeply to him. This trip was just getting fun, and now we're going to get sidetracked. I'm sure Orochimaru heard about our plans. His bright blue eyes sharply looked towards his students' tents, and he smiled a little when he saw Noriko, Inari, and Cam standing at attention in front of their tents. He was teaching them how to sleep well and what to do in these kinds of situations. In this case, the right thing to do was to wait patiently for the group's leader or leaders to show up and give them their tasks. Suddenly, there was a huge explosion in front of them that shook the ground. Mole jumped in front of her leader and built a mud wall to protect her from the fallout. She casually looked over and saw Naruto build a big blue ball of protection around Yugido, two of her dark allies, and himself, his eyes widening in shock. He quickly dropped the blue iron ball and jumped over the mud wall with one hand. Even though the campground was full of dust, he looked first for his students. He ran towards them and let out a big sigh of relief when he saw a blazing blue dome of seal protection covering the genin. Nariko was in the middle of the dome, holding the seal up with both hands. The young blonde's senses started to tingle, so he moved out of the way of a clubbing blow from a grotesque, warty gray beast with a club four times the size of his whole body. He crossed his fingers, and a flurry of papers, six in all, fell into his hands. He slapped them on the monster's stomach before it could come to its senses and realize that the person it was going to attack had just gotten away at the last second. 
Naruto covered himself with another iron blue bubble as the explosion caused by his last move blew up the creature without mercy and splattered blood and guts all over the camp, but that was the least of his worries. Naruto turned quickly towards the crater and glared when he saw blonde hair under the foot of another disgusting, huge monster. Without stopping to think, he rushed forward and slammed his palms into the monster. A whirlwind of paper came out of both of his sleeves, and the boy flicked his fingers quickly, barely noticing, and they curved around the monster's downward smash and cut hard into its head. Boom. The boy jumped on top of his injured friend, which surprised him. Yumi Cho may not have been the strongest member of the alliance, but her people respected her. It wasn't just because she made smart decisions or was pretty. It was also because she didn't let her position as successor make her weak. Her skills were high Junin or even mid cage level. The woman looked like she had been hit back and forth, probably by those strange, disgusting monsters that were controlled by their summoner and attacked her. If the attackers did this much damage to his friend, they must be high Junin. He told his dark ninjas to go help the chill Anbu fight in the forest, because they needed all the help they could get. Yumi looked at Naruto with strong eyes and tried to stand up, but a firm hand on her shoulder kept her down. Naruto didn't look at her as he raised his left forearm to block a chakra scalpel from a man with silver hair and glasses. Flashback end. Yugito Ne was getting more and more surprised as he watched all of this. The boy, who was known as the best fuinjutsu expert in the world and had so much chakra that it could bring most people to their knees, seemed to be able to hold his own against two behemoths and a sound ninja, if the forehead protector was any indication. She didn't know that the boy's fight against the Kyubi in his landscape for ultimate control had used up more than half of his chakra and left him with just enough to run. The boy's first two attacks, paper bombs, were easy for him to use because he was very good at them. However, the chakra beam and the two iron blue bubbles he called up were tiring him out. As the wave leader told his genin fuinjutsu user to cast a barrier seal around his team and the injured chill leader, he quietly told her to watch over them while he went into the forest to help his dark and the chill anbu. After a few moments of hesitating and swaying from side to side, she decided to leave a fully powered lightning clone with the team and blurred after him to see what else he could do. Naruto was hopping quickly from tree branch to tree branch to get to the fight. He frowned as he felt concentrated lightning affinity chakra following him, but he put it out of his mind for now because he had to deal with these sound ninjas first. His chakra was slowly coming back, but not quickly enough for him to wait. This left him with only one other way to beat the fighters. When he saw where they were fighting, his sky blue eyes turned dark and dangerous. He sped up and crashed into the glade. The sudden sound made Kitamaru's head spin, and he yelled as two feet stepped on his face, knocking his head to the ground and making a small crater under him as an effect. Naruto spread out his senses as far as his limited energy would let him, and in three seconds, he took in everything. Two chill Anbu and two dark ninjas seemed to be out cold, and the rest were fighting hard against four shinobi wearing the hitate of the hidden sound, except for the one he was standing on. He couldn't just shoot them with chakra beams because he could only use one before he passed out from exhaustion. That wouldn't work in this situation. So, he hopped right up to one of the attackers, whose back had a head growing out of it, and fought him hand to hand. Naruto's fighting style was a twisted, older version of the classic Iwa kick boxing style. His fists and feet were secondary weapons, while his forearms and shins were his main weapons, and if he used them well enough, he wouldn't even need to use his fists. The boy learned the fighting style because he liked Fuinjutsu, but now that he couldn't use seals with it, it was just a little bit harder for him to use but it wasn't anything he couldn't handle. The boy slapped away both hands that were on his shoulders with his forearms, which were protected by their guards. He then slammed his right shin into the side with such force that it cracked a rib. He pulled his forearms back and smashed them into the attacker's face at the same time. This broke the attacker's nose and pushed him away so Naruto could go after the next person, a girl with bright red hair who was putting a flute to her lips and blowing. He knew that the flute was a kind of weapon, so he flicked his fingers at her and twelve paper shuriken shot out of his sleeves. Tiyuya ducked out of the way just in time, but she didn't expect the paper weapons to follow her and keep her from blowing her flute. The girl who was swearing was too busy running away from the bombs to notice that another barrage was coming at her from the other side. Boom. The first round of spinning, sharp paper sheets hit the first explosion, which caused the ground to shake violently. Boom. Two down. Ease up, kid, you're really low on chakra, Kayubi grumbled as it lazily lay under the seal tree, dipping a tail into the crimson red part of the chakra pool to get more chakra. Naruto wasn't so lucky. To get his chakra back, he had to wait like everyone else. 
When have I ever not taken it easy? Naruto grunted and rolled backwards as web shot from the first ninja he attacked. He quickly sent a dark ninja to get the first two ninja he had fought. Mole walked up to him with her tonto out and dark green blood dripping from it. She suddenly told her boss, blood clones, sir, and he hummed and thought. Then send out the clones, the captain said with a salute, and he disappeared to deal with the person who seemed to be in charge of the sound ninjas. His tailed beast friend said, they were probably testing your strength, and Naruto nodded after a short pause. It's a good thing my chakra is low, huh? Kayubi asked, why is that? As he carefully watched his holder scan the area for more enemies, even though the remaining Anbu were doing a good job of taking care of them on their own. The boy got an answer when he quickly raised his right forearm to block a chakra scalpel, lifted his left foot to avoid being tripped, and took a step back when a knee was driven into his stomach. Naruto stayed calm as the face of his attacker finally reminded him of someone. You were in the Chunin exams, he said after a moment, remembering what his beast had asked. Kabuto rolled his eyes and took a few deep breaths because he was trying so hard to stay a corporal, blood clone. And you're that kid with a disability that Sandame turned down. When Naruto heard this, he got a strange grin on his face. Why, yes, I am. This confused the medic ninja clone, so he ran to Kabuto. The ninja poked the younger boy in the head, but Naruto fell to his knees to avoid the deadly chakra scalpel. He then used the movement to pull Kabuto's right leg back, bringing him to the ground. Naruto got to his feet and twisted the leg hard, breaking the bone. He then put his foot on Kabuto's back and gave a strong pull on the leg to pull it out completely. Kayubi laughed and snorted with amusement as Naruto dropped the torn leg on Kabuto's head multiple times, crushing his skull. The medic ninja didn't even have time to scream in pain from the torn limb before his head became a bloody smear on the ground, and his body slowly followed, proving Mole's report that the attackers were just highly powered blood clones. The leg he was holding fell apart into clumps of dried blood on the ground. The boy rubbed his hand on his trousers to get them off as he knelt down next to his two unconscious dark operatives and felt for a pulse. There was a pulse, which was good, but his senses told him that their chakra was all over the place, as if they had been hit by a strong genjutsu. Genjutsu. He reached out with his senses to the nearby chill Anbu and found that they, too, were under a genjutsu that was so strong he didn't think he had enough chakra to break it. He snapped his fingers and Eagle and Raven came running over from where they were looking for the attackers. They took blood samples from them and put them away so they could send them back to Marsh for the lab technicians there to study. They could send it to Wave, but since the village was still growing, they didn't have enough money to buy cutting-edge equipment because they were still training people to work in the labs. Naruto just said, they're under genjutsu, and Raven, a genjutsu master, slapped his hands together and muttered. Kai. 10 AM. Ichikraku ramen stand. Konohagakure no sato. Yukumo jumped up and down on her stool while she waited for her ramen and looked for someone in the busy but not too busy stand. Hanada was sitting to her right, with her back against the counter. She looked over at Sasuke, who was sitting next to her and shrugged in response to her question. The young Uchiha frowned when he saw a man with blue hair and tan skin walk into the stand and sit down next to him. The Uchiha and Hayuga took this as a sign that they should also sit down. The man gave them a friendly smile and asked for a bowl of ramen. Naruto-sama says hello, but he couldn't be here in person because. We know that he has an important job to do in Kumo. Hanada spoke up and looked at her bowl of ramen with a frown. How is Sensei? Sasuke and Yukumo both looked at the man with interest, and Naruto's Konoha students waited patiently for the man to tell them how Naruto was doing. Under a henge, Daku smiled a little at the students and turned to face them. To keep himself steady, he put his right arm on the counter. Naruto-sama is fine. He just wishes he could be here to see you two off. Yukumo sighed and poked at her noodles, as if she suddenly didn't want to eat. But he promised to be in Suna for the last part of your exams. Gara-sama has already set aside a room in his house for him. That was kind of him too. Hanada's voice trailed off as she slowly stirred her broth and ramen, a look of disappointment on her face. Naruto-sama also told me to give you three copies of this letter, he started, but Sasuke jumped up in surprise before he could finish. Sensei sent a letter? He asked, gaping a little, and Daku laughed as he pulled out a light blue envelope with a Six Village Alliance stamp on it. The stamp was a small square with a picture of a shiny silver train with puffs of smoke coming out of it, which represented the Alliance's close connection and trust through the trains. 
Sasuke didn't grab the letter from Daku's hand. Instead, he looked over his shoulder at Hanada, who was in charge of the group because she was Naruto's oldest student. When she gave him the okay, he gently took the letter from the seal creation. Naruto put her in charge of his team of Konoha students because she was his first and strongest student. Sasuke didn't like it because he was used to being the strongest in his generation, but Naruto never did anything without a reason. For example, their teacher once told them to spin on their heels for 30 minutes straight. Sasuke thought the order was pointless and just a punishment, but after the session, when they had all thrown up everything they had eaten, they all realized, to their utter shock, that when their chakra was depleted, leaving just a small amount, they could they kept spinning every day to help them get used to it. Back to the problem at hand, the Hokage had told the Konoha students to wait at the ramen stand, which usually meant that Naruto was coming to the village. The two genin were about to leave for Suna in about two hours, and they thought Naruto might want to see them off, maybe even taking a break from his mission to do so. Instead, Daku showed up. Hanada took the letter from Sasuke and opened it carefully, her heart thumping nervously and her hands just barely shaking. Yukumo bit her lip as she looked at the letter, and Sasuke leaned in to see what their teacher had written, pushing Daku out of their circle. When Ayame brought Daku's order, he smiled and thanked her. Then, he slowly slurped the noodles and let his master's students read the letter. Dear Hanada, Sasuke and Yukumo. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but as you may know, I have an important job that can't be put off. I will, however, be there to watch the last part of the exams, which I'm sure you will be in. Hanada and Sasuke, I don't want you to hold back or get too confident about the exams. I've taught you better, and you know what happens when you underestimate an opponent, and I'm sure you all know what I'll do if I find out that's what you did. You are all strong, even Yukumo, who blushed a little and laughed. I want the world to see what your months of hard work have led to. This isn't about me or showing what I can teach, but about you guys. Hanada, you've learned a lot from me, and you've shown me that you won't give up as long as you have breath in your body. I'm proud of you for that. Don't let anyone tell you how to live your life. There aren't many people I can say this to, and Sasuke is one of them. Your fighting spirit and desire to get better is amazing. I am happy for you. Don't let anyone make you feel bad. Yukumo, you are the youngest of my students, but your drive to get better always impresses me. You are no longer a weak little girl. I am happy for you. Don't listen to anyone who says otherwise. I'm proud of you all more than I can say on paper, and I'm sure that both of you will be promoted and that you, Yukumo, will soon join them. Well, I have to go now because we're almost done packing up camp and heading to Kumo. I'll do my best to finish the mission and meet up with you guys. I'll even bring my Genin team to watch because they really want to see you guys. We'll see you all in Suna. Uzumaki Naruto. Wave Country's leader. The Genin and the Academy student had been served ramen bowls, which were now cooling down. Hanada put the letter down and looked at her fellow Konoha students of Naruto. Their faces were set in grim determination as they nodded at each other. Yukumo got the letter from the Hayuga, and she put it in her backpack. Daku put the bowl of ramen in his mouth and smacked his lips in pleasure. Naruto-sama also told me to tell you that if you make it to the third stage, he has a surprise for you three. He looked in his pockets and pulled out a brown wallet. He put a few bills on the counter and pointed to himself and the three students. I'll pay for your ramen, so don't worry about it. Thank you. As was usual for their teacher, Yukumo stutteringly tried to understand the simple letter. Daku gave Sasuke and Hanada a warm smile and ruffled their hair playfully, which broke the stunned silence. Good luck. He left before Sasuke could hit him for making Sasuke's hair look bad. The Uchiha and the rest of the students quickly ate their ramen right before they got up from their stools. Let's go make Sensei proud. Hanada said something to Sasuke and gave him a fist bump. She then put her arm around Yukumo's small shoulders and walked out of the stand to report to their teams. Kumogakir no Sato main gate. Kumogakir. Lightning country. This one is dangerous, kitten. The Nibi told her jailer what she heard, and Yugito nodded in her head as she looked at Naruto from the side of her eyes. The boy was walking slowly next to her with his hands behind his head and his eyes on the entrance gate. His guards were all over the place, and Yumi, who was floating in a wheelchair in front of them, was talking to a chill dark operative in hushed tones. That attack with the chakra beam was no joke. Seriously, I didn't think it was that important, but if that glasses guy hadn't switched, the lightning attack could have killed him. She got over being scared, and that's when she saw the wave leader for the first time. 
He was a head and a half taller than her, with messy blonde hair and bright, smart blue eyes that had a hint of mischief in them. He was wearing black ninja pants and blue sandals with white and black stripes on the sleeves of his dark blue long-sleeved shirt. On his head was a light blue leader's hat with a wide brim, and his light blue leader's cloak fluttered in the wind as he walked with confidence. Again, the Kumo ninja noticed that Naruto was acting friendly, like he didn't want to make her feel uncomfortable. He was a level 9 and a half Fuinjutsu prodigy who had beaten many powerful opponents, some with skills and jutsus he had made himself. He was the leader of Wave Country, which was slowly growing and would definitely become a big village if things kept going the way they were. Despite his age, he was the main spokesperson for the Six Village Country Alliance, because he had shown many times that he was older than his age indicated. He had worked hard for everything he had and everything he had done. Anyone who heard about what he had done and what he could do would want to stay away from him, but that wasn't what he was going for. She didn't know she had been staring at the other blonde ninja so hard until he told her. Yugito san what do you think? The woman shook her head and coughed. How are you so strong, Naruto-sama? The boy laughed and shook his head as if he couldn't take it anymore. I'm getting tired of having to answer that question. She started to say, I'm sorry, but a dismissive hand gesture cut her off. It's because nearly everyone I meet asks me that question. He stuck out his thumb over his shoulder to his students, who were walking behind him and answering questions from Baboon, a dark agent, about Kumo from the book Naruto had told them to read. They asked me, too. It's not often that someone as young as you is a leader, Naruto-sama. Yugito said in a polite way. I had the right people behind me. He's talking about Kuni. What did Nibi say? I had no idea that jerk had it in him. Your silence tells me that the two tales told you who I was talking about, he said. Yugito gave a small smile and a nod. She says that he is a jerk. Kayubi grumbled, but Naruto laughed. If I'm a pig, then she's a horny piece of cat poop. He crossed his arms and sat back on a normal tree in the Mindscapes forest. The two tails holder asked the other blonde, what did he say? They both smiled. He said that she was a pervert. Both Jinchuriki winced when their beasts started yelling like crazy, but then they ignored them and rolled their eyes. When the procession got to the village gate, the Rakage, A, was there to greet them with his big body. The huge man, whose muscles were thicker than Naruto's head, reached out and firmly shook Naruto's hand. The boy tried not to flinch when the older man's strong grip crushed his hand, but he answered right away when a seal on his elbow lit up. A grinned widely at how strong the handshake was. You're a lot taller than I thought. The man with white hair said. Naruto was only a few inches shorter than the man in height. Naruto didn't know what to say, so he just smiled wider and crushed the man's hand back. It was like a race to see whose hand would break first, and he'd rather die than give up. Rakage sama Yugito said something slowly, and the man slowly let go of Naruto's hand. Naruto reluctantly returned the favor, watching the man closely to see if he was trying to trick him. Oh, yes. Welcome to Kumogakure, Naruto Dono. Thanks, Adono. He pointed to Yumi on his side and told her who she was. This is Hidden Chill's leader, Yumi Cho. She is in a wheelchair because she was hurt in a previous attack and can't walk. Even though the wheelchair was more of a chair than a wheelchair, the rakage took the woman's hand and gently shook it, making sure not to use the same force he had used to shake Naruto. The blonde female leader didn't like being left out of the strength competition, so she quickly squeezed the man's thick hand. The stacked cage let out a small yelp of surprise, then grinned in approval. As Naruto went on, he let go of her hand and pointed to the three people behind him. This is my genin team, made up of Kaiza Inari, Manzo Nariko, and Hoshi Kamlin. The three students bowed respectfully, and the big cage gave them a wave. Everyone is welcome in my town. He took them into the village and told Yugito to go home. The rakage walked with his hands behind his back between the two leaders to the cage's tower. I'm sorry we didn't send more ninjas to bring you here with us, but we were inundated with urgent mission requests. Naruto shook his head and replied. It's okay, we got there earlier than planned. I appreciate your understanding. Before he looked at the hurt village leader, the man gave a rough answer. I think it would be best if you rested before we talked about the alliance. It's still early in the day, so we can talk about the alliance. Naruto turned and spoke to Yumi. Your wounds are very bad, and you should go rest if you don't want to. 
Yumi told him that as soon as she got close to the sound attackers, the redhead put her under a very powerful sound-based genjutsu. After that, she didn't remember much until she hit the ground and was stepped on by one of the smelly monsters. Wave had already heard from Naruto about what to do. She rolled her eyes. This is nothing, so let's just talk about the alliance. They went into the tower and went to the Reikage's office. Oto Agakure. Grass Country. This whole thing reminded Daku of his master's attack to get back at the people who destroyed Hoshigakure. The dark shadow in Henja's blue hair walked slowly towards Sound. As he walked, his form changed a few times before he went back to being himself. His red eyes sparkled evilly from behind his blue camo turban, and he cracked his fists, sending two stone batons slithering out of his hands. The tips of the batons glowed white with Fuenjutsu. No one noticed the first attack, but they did notice the second one. This was something the seal creation kept saying to himself as a constant, annoying reminder that people still wanted to kill his master. And this made him very angry. Didn't they know that his master was the strongest? Didn't they realize that his conservatism was a good thing and not something to be taken lightly? Didn't they see that he, Daku, and all of Dark would gladly bring the world to his master if he told them to? Didn't they know that his master was being kind by letting Iwa and Sound get ready for the war? That he could just tell his wave shinobi to roll over his enemies, and they would do it with smiles on their faces and songs in their hearts. They didn't respect his master, and Daku didn't like that. The monster's eyes burned with righteous anger as the village, carefully guarded by missing ninjas and sound shinobi, appeared in front of him. Slowly, his turban unfurled, and the cloth behind him moved like two wings, flapping erratically in the wind as if they had minds of their own and revealing Daku's hidden form. There was a blue flame that was still burning, and two bright red stones with vulpine iris designs floating where the eyes should have been. As Daku's true form became clear, the air got thicker and more ominous, and the grass around the beast shook from the increase in air pressure. As the loyal servant of the wave leader put more Kyubi chakra into them, the tips of his seal reinforced stone batons began to smoke. Under the fire creature, who looked more like a demon than a human, an Uzumaki spiral slowly grew. It started under his feet and grew three feet away from him. The whirlpool lit up red, and Daku knelt down to get ready to run. The demonic seal creature growled menacingly and charged into the hidden village. Naruto's order was still in its mind, even though it was burning with a thirst for blood and death. Tear down half the village and kill the most important shinobi. Reikage's office. Kumogakure no Sato. Lightning Country. Tell me, Naruto Dono, why does your six village alliance want to work with my small village? I asked as he leaned back in his chair, interlaced his fingers over his chiseled stomach, and stared straight at the leaders in front of him, who were so calm it was scary. Naruto moved in his seat and crossed his right foot over his left knee. He leaned back in the chair in front of the cage's desk that had been offered to him. He cocked his head to the side and looked at Yumi, who was still sitting in his wheelchair, with a curious eyebrow raised. Yumi looked back at him with a knowing smirk, and then he turned back to look at the heavily muscled man. You mean besides the fact that Kumo has the strongest ninjas and the best fabrics in the world? Oh, stop being so nice. The man said something and waved his hands around, but this time he put his hands behind his head. Wave leader, chill leader, tell me the truth. Why do you need Kumo when it's clear you don't? Naruto still wouldn't give up, but Yumi spoke up after a quick look at the main alliance spokesman. What do you mean that it's clear we don't need to join forces with your respected village? A changed positions again. He put his forearms on the strong desk and looked over it at his visitors, two village leaders who were surprisingly young but strong. Well, for starters, it's common knowledge that the chill, smoke combo is new and pretty strong. Two Junin could easily make a mid to high A rank attack, counter, or defense by combining their jutsu. Yes, I have been paying close attention to your alliance. He said at Naruto's unsaid question. Another thing is that, for lack of a better word, your alliance's barrier seal is amazing. Naruto Dono let the Kumo group into his village and was kind enough to let them test the defenses. The defenses were a lightning force field that covered the whole village and sensory seals that could reach miles away and even over water. The attacker would die if they even touched the electric field, and I think you, Naruto Dono, still think this defense isn't done. Naruto was happy. Yes, I still want to add a lot of things. A laugh let out a loud laugh. I've never seen a village defense wall be so weak in all my life. Every defense has a back door. People just don't know where the back door to the alliance barrier is. 
Naruto simply said. Anyway. Rakage kept going. Your alliance has the support of four major villages, including the hard-to-find Hidden Rain village, as well as a lot of smaller villages, maybe half of the continent's worth. Most of them are about trade. Yumi said. Of course. A grunted. Even so, your alliance is still on the rise, but that doesn't count your first servant, Daku-san, the Fuinjutsu monster. The man was bored and rolled his wrist. I think this whole war thing between Sound and Iwa is a joke. If you leave Kumo out of it, they have almost no chance of winning against your alliance. They might have a chance against 10 villages, plus or minus a few small villages, if they brought back legendary shinobi from the dead, but that's crazy, right? Naruto put both feet on the ground flat and gave a shrug. Most of my fellow soldiers know that I am very, very careful. I have too much to lose at this point if I lose. I have a country to run, friends to protect, students to teach, and a lot more to learn. So your only reason for wanting to work with Kumo is to help yourself. I brought it up right away, and Naruto didn't miss a step. If taking care of what I love is selfish, then I must be the most selfish ninja in the world. Yumi's neck snapped around to the younger ninja in shock, and she gaped at what he said. The fact that he didn't think twice about calling himself selfish shocked both of the older ninjas. I never meant for my friends and allies to be this widespread. In fact, making friends was at the bottom of my list. But a friend of mine pushed me to make the most of myself, even though life kept beating me down, and I found a family in Wave. I wanted to make sure my family was safe, so I joined the Six Village Alliance and added more people to my family. Now I have friends and allies with whom I can fight life together, and I do anything to keep them safe. At the end of his speech, he looked hard at the bigger man. A stared back hard, making the air tense. Yumi was about to break the tension by changing the subject for a moment, but the rakage burst out laughing. Naruto didn't find it funny, though. A few months before you were born, your mother punched me for making fun of you. Naruto's eyes got very big. You knew my mum, did you? I gave a head shake. No, I didn't know your mother or father. But after what happened with Hyuga, relations between Konoha and Kumo were still tense, so we had to meet in secret. As proof, he reached into the small pocket of his cage's cloak and took out a small black and white photo. He threw it to the boy, and Naruto caught it between his index and middle fingers, like he did when he was making paper bombs, and looked at the picture. In the picture, Minato was laughing so hard that he couldn't stop. He was holding Kashina back by her waist as her arms and legs went after A, who had a black eye and a bruise on his cheek. Even though the woman was very pregnant, that didn't stop her from struggling in her husband's arms and yelling what Naruto could guess were a string of bad words he would rather not hear. The rakage, who looked to be in his late twenties, was painfully rubbing his cheek and trying to stay as far away as possible from the wild Uzumaki. Naruto didn't realize how much he was smiling until Yumi gently touched his arm and woke him up. That picture was taken by my brother B. We were about to go to Tanzuki Town for our annual gambling trip, but since I called you a weak little runt, in jest, which you were at the time, we had to cancel and try again another day. The man tried not to wince. Her bad language still makes me dream. The blonde boy laughed and wiped a happy tear from his eye as he did so. I've heard that she had the mouth of a sailor. A shook his head no once more. No, she talked like the mother-in-law of a sailor's wife, believe me. The man laughed and pounded his fists on his desk as he did so. Yumi laughed with him and giggled behind her hands when he told her about Naruto's mother. The man slowly stopped laughing and looked at Naruto with a serious face. Getting back to this alliance, I want to be a part of it, not because you are your father's son or even your mother's son, but because you are your own person. Almost everyone knows what you did to get where you are now, and I admire your drive. Naruto put his fingers into his left sleeve and pulled out a normal-sized scroll. I appreciate it. But. Naruto stopped as he was about to unroll the scroll on the desk after hearing a shout. The living mountain of pure muscle got up from his seat and stood tall, casting a shadow over Naruto and Yumi. Only if you can beat me in an all-out one-on-one -on -one fight. The young seal master also got up, put the scroll back in his sleeve, and smiled like the other man. As one, they reached out to shake hands, and as they did, they both gave each other a nod. Yumi could do nothing but sit back and slap her face in disgust. Ah, uh, Mina. On that day, blood fell from the sky in hidden sound, grass country. 
All of sound was destroyed by a beast made of deep red fire that held white hot stone rods in its hands. He killed any shinobi, from Junin to Jenin, who tried to stand in his way. He didn't think twice about it. His red eyes were like a fox's, and he looked straight ahead. The Otokages were building his goal, and he killed and smashed anyone who got in his way. Civilians ran away in all directions, but not even they were safe. Naruto had given very clear orders, take out half of sound. And hurt Orochimaru of the Sanin so badly that he can't move or think. Daku pushed away a man who was using a pickaxe as a weapon. He didn't use clones to do this because he thought the man was an overzealous civilian with little or no shinobi training. He didn't care. With every step he took, a trail of blue fire that was so hot it burned everything to the ground followed behind him. He went to the main door of the Otokage's administrative building, which was a two-story building that looked more like a high-tech lab with underground tunnels, and let his chakra feel around inside. When he felt a short burst of chakra behind the door, he squinted his eyes suspiciously. At this point, no one would come near him, so he didn't bother to look over his shoulder before he kicked the door open. Then he quickly looked into a pair of Eternal Mangekyo Sharingans and couldn't take his eyes off of them. Eternal Mangekyo Sharingan, Deep Genjutsu Sleep It sounded like he had just woken up and was about to go back to sleep for a few more minutes. Daku couldn't stop his chakra from flaring up, and the fire behind him went out. His blue camo turban wrapped around his head again, and his stone batons broke into dust. Over his fox-like eyes, an exact copy of the user's M's began to spin and move. The Sharingan moved quickly, and Daku felt himself fall backwards. As soon as his back hit the ground, his body fell apart into a wooden skeleton with stone joints, fingers, toes, and a skull, wrapped in black and blue clothes. There wasn't enough chakra to give him skin, and there wasn't enough chakra to power the different seals that covered the base form. Madara laughed and turned off his Sharingan while looking over his shoulder at Sanin's evil grin. Is this the animal you said would be hard to deal with? You insult me, snake. Orochimaru let out a low laugh that sounded like a deep hiss as he turned around and told Madara Uchiha, the puppet he was controlling, to follow him. The reincarnated legend did so with a deep frown on his face. I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings, Lord Madara. I really thought he was smarter than that. They went quietly down the stairs to the corridors in the basement. Orochimaru let out a proud hiss through his thin lips. Just a few days more. A few minutes ago. Training Ground Zero. Reikage's Quarters. Kumogakir no Sato. Naruto looked at his opponent, the Reikage, who was on the other side of the special training ground. The boy rolled his shoulders and cracked his neck once while the muscled man threw his coat and hat away. You fight without your shirt? The blonde boy asked the other blonde. The man grinned savagely. Only when I want to go all out, he said, clenching his fists so hard that they made a loud cracking sound. Don't you take yours off? Naruto answered without missing a beat, I'd rather not. Naruto's dark guards and the Reikage's own guard, Yugito, stood off to the side of the battleground because B and his team were out of Kumo on a mission. Mole sat on the soft grass with her legs crossed and both hands on the ground as a touch sensor in case something unexpected happened. She nodded her head to the right and left, and her subordinates saluted and blended into the environment. Yugito just leaned against a tree and watched as the two leaders got into their ready positions. A was the first to move forward. His two fists led the way as lightning bolts shot off his body and burned the grassy ground. When he saw how fast it was going, Naruto's eyes got big, and he crossed his arms over his face, which was the target. When Mole felt her master's chakra change in a violent way, she closed her eyes and focused. She saw something she never thought she'd see in all her time as Naruto's servant, his defenses got a little bit weaker, but not enough for most people to notice in the heat of battle. Yugito jumped to her feet and ran to her master as soon as this happened. She yelled out in protest as she stood up sharply. Everything went very slowly. Mole forced her arms and legs to move faster. Naruto's arms fell even further, letting the older ninja's lightning-covered fist hit his face without protection. A smiled at the chance and let his fists rush forward, but he didn't notice that Naruto's eyes had become half-closed and his toxic red Sharingan covered them. He didn't care about anything else, not even the woman with brown hair who was running towards them and yelling at him to stop. Yugito ran after her because she thought the woman with the mole mask was out to hurt her village leader. As the world moved like it was made of thick syrup, Naruto's arms and legs gave out, and he started to fall backwards. 
The sleeping boy's face was less than a millimeter away, and a thin sphere of purple chakra covered his whole body to protect him from the attack and its backlash. However, since he didn't have any root seals to hold him in place, his limp body was blasted off the ground and into a strong mahogany tree. Mole grabbed Naruto's shirt, but the force of the attack threw her after him as well. Her fingers were just inside the weak purple backup defense. The woman quickly used her body to cover her master, wrapping her arms tightly around him and making sure his head was safe under her chin. This was just in time, because as soon as her back hit the hard tree, it caved in. Mole put her master down gently and checked out his body by putting her hands on his forehead and chest, right over his heart. She did this even though she was hurt. The wave leader's chakra was all over the place, and this seemed to have put him into a state of hypersleep. She lifted his eyelids all the way, and her eyes grew wide with fear when she saw a pair of evolved Sharingans, like the ones she had read about in Root. When it came up behind the loyal-to-death dark shinobi, she didn't look up. Mole clenched her teeth when she heard the sound of a kanai being taken out of its sheath. The kanai was then put on her neck, and she could only guess that Yugito was behind it. Leopard quickly slapped the kanai out of her hand and shoved the woman away. Raven kneeled down next to her, looked at Naruto, and when she came to the same conclusion as her captain, they exchanged grim looks. Yugito's weapon fell to the ground, and her nails grew into sharp claws. She was ready to tear Leopard into bloody pieces, but she hesitated when Eagle joined her and stood guard over their sleeping master. A pulled her back before she could get in trouble with Wave's best. The grim atmosphere around Mole and Raven, who were kneeling on the ground, scared him. As he knelt down near Naruto's body, he waved for everyone to calm down and told them again that he didn't mean any harm. Why is he acting like that? Raven looked to her captain, Mole, for permission to speak, and Mole gave it to her with a curt nod. She gently unsealed his wheelchair from his left wrist while praying in her mind that he would forgive her for having to roll up his sleeves a bit. Lord Reikage, my lord Naruto Uzumaki is under a genjutsu, she said in a strong voice that gave away the emotional turmoil she was feeling. She was one of the most loyal Hoshi ninjas in his army because, even though he took her clan from their first home, he gave them a place to live that was even better and gave them the same rights as Waveborn. He was the perfect example of the strength, calm, and power that she had hoped to reach one day. Her life in Hoshigakure wasn't the best, but she was saved that day along with many other chunin. Serving Naruto as a ninja was a great honor for her and a big part of the Hoshi clan. But being his personal guard was even better. She couldn't find the words to describe how humbled she felt when Daku called her to his office and told her that she was on the list of people who would protect the wave leader. Naruto then talked to each of the four chosen people one on one, without their masks. That day, she tried not to cry from excitement. She didn't have a dark past like her captain, Mole, or a close relationship with a leader like Daku, but Naruto said that she was good at something that he wanted to get good at one day. Genjutsu. The young leader could only stop people from having common illusions, from low E to high A. He could deflect all of them, though some were easier than others. The seal master told her that he needed her genjutsu skills on his guard team in case he or her team fell for an illusion that his seals couldn't easily break. She thought a musical trick was easy, so she didn't fall for it when the sound four blood clones attacked. Now, though, she felt useless as she watched Mole put her lord in his wheelchair. A scratched his chin and said, I didn't use genjutsu on him. It's a very strong Sharingan genjutsu, she said mechanically as she knelt down next to her master's wheelchair and checked him again to see if she could do anything. Eagle and Leopard stayed between their lord and Yugito the whole time, which made Yugito very angry. Baboon was a member of Naruto's team of genin. Raven got up easily and spoke to her captain in a whisper. I can't do anything to get rid of the genjutsu without hurting his mind, she said, nervously running her fingers through her short, neat, dark purple bob cut hair. She was trying to come up with a way to fight one of the strongest illusions she had ever read about. What do you think we ought to do? Raven put her fingers together and made a low droning sound. We need to get him back to wave and quickly ask Itachi to come and see what he can do, said Mole. Naruto was rolled away by Mole, and the others quickly followed. Mole told Raven something in a whisper, and she nodded, walked slowly back to the confused Kumo Shinobi, and said. I'm sorry, Lord Rakage, but we'll have to put off signing the alliance until another day. I still don't understand how a Sharingan Genjutsu can affect him here, where there aren't any Uchiha for miles, he said with a frown and a chin scratch. Then, in a playful way, he added, there are no Uchiha for miles around. Are you sure he's not just pretending? 
Raven didn't find his jokes funny. Lord Rakage, my lord Naruto Uzumaki does not lie about things like that. Okay, okay, sorry, he apologies. If he needs anything from Kumo, don't be afraid to ask. With a deep bow, Raven hurried back to her sleeping lord and her other allies. Yugito clenched her teeth in pain as she watched her leave. Lord A, do you want me to kill them? She bowed and ran after them. No, just make sure they leave Lightning Country safely. Mole asked the team's resident genjutsu expert, out of earshot of the cat Jinchuriki, what do you think is going on with Master? Has he been hurt? Is he in pain? Raven put her hand on Naruto's head and focused on finding something she recognized. Fighting spirit in humans. She gave a bad sign by shaking her head. My lord Naruto's chakra control is messed up. It seems like someone else's chakra is trying to take over, but my lord's chakra is so much more and stronger that nothing can beat him. Then what do you think is happening? Raven lowered her head and slowly took her hand off of her master's head. She did this with a small frown on her face, which was hidden by her raven mask. Even though the foreign chakra is fighting my lord's chakra and losing, master can't just be pulled out by dispelling the illusion. Think of it like he's. She searched for the right word and muttered it when she found it. Sleeping. A really deep sleep. Mole pushed the blonde past some curious Kumo people while whispering, Master is sleeping. The Genjutsu master nodded. Yes, and the only way I can fully study him is to ask Itachi about his own Mangekyo Sharingan, she said. Her eyes found her master's students, and they ran over to them. Inari looked at his slumped over teachers with red, half-closed eyes. He didn't even move to ask them how their trip had been, which was very unlike him. The fishboy asked, what's wrong with sensei? He was trying to figure out what leopard was trying to tell baboon with his hand gestures. Naruto had taught them all of the hand signs, but the dark ninjas were moving their hands much too fast for any of the genin to catch. Raven replied softly, he's sleeping. She then pushed the crowd of genin to keep walking until they reached the gate, where they started to jog steadily. Cam raised her eyebrows and looked at her teacher with a fixed gaze. When Inari wanted to ask her how she knew how Naruto slept, she turned her head and hissed at him, Sensei doesn't sleep like that. She didn't tell Noriko, which was sad. How do you know what Sensei does when he sleeps? She whispered, that's none of your business. If it weren't so tense, the two male genin would have laughed at how upset she was getting. We'll tell you when we get to Marsh, but for now we need to move quickly, Mole said with a low grunt. He and his friends sped up, making sure not to wake up their sleeping master. Yumi and her guards were at the end of the line. Now that the woman was better, she didn't need the wave leader's wheelchair anymore. She knew what had happened because a guard told her, and she didn't want to slow them down by asking silly questions. When they came out of the dense trees at Lightning Country's border, Mole muttered her apologies again and unsealed Naruto's seal board from his elbow. She had to roll up his left sleeve to do this, which showed his sleeve of seal tattoos for a split second before a small burst of chakra smoke covered them up. The captain threw the board about a foot away and said, expand, as she opened her arms. Before another burst of smoke covered it, the wooden board shook, and steel plates were put over its weaker wood parts. Eagle used a simple windjutsu to clear away the smoke, revealing a solid metal board big enough to hold everyone, including Yumi and her guards, though the extra weight would slow them down. Mole could always ask Yumi to stay behind. The chill leader wouldn't mind if it helped her friend get back to his country quickly, but Naruto told her that the woman shouldn't be separated from the group again, especially after what happened during the Sound 4 blood clone attack. On the expanded skateboard, there were 13 blue circles that lit up an average-sized wooden chairs in the middle. When people sat down on the chairs, they felt seals hold them in place. As the board's pilot, Naruto was supposed to sit in the very front seat, but he couldn't do that in his condition, so he was put in the front right row with Baboon behind him, Eagle to his left, Raven in front, Leopard at the very back with the chill watching their flank, and the wave leader's students, Inari, Cam, and Nariko, in the very middle rows. Mole sat down in the pilot's seat and took a deep breath. She thought back to what Naruto had told her about how to fly his expanded seal board. It was an idea that the seal master was still working on, and he was making steady progress on it. He wanted to come up with a safe way to fly that could carry more than 50 people at once without much trouble. He wasn't moving as fast as he wanted to, but he had made some big discoveries in his research that he quickly put to use on his board as it grew. Mole clapped her hands, and a dome of hazy, light blue chakra surrounded them all, protecting them from attacks from the outside. 
She changed between two hand seals, the dragon and the rat, and the chakra in front of her got thicker until it looked dark blue from the inside but was the same color from the outside. The blue chakra wall rotated on its own, and circles and switches with correct kanji labels melted out of the part of the wall above her. The woman with brown hair reached her hand into the slow spinning vortex and pulled out a small, well-made wooden wheel with a wave country sign drawn in the middle. She flipped three switches above her with her right hand and pressed two buttons with her left. From outside the seal board, the appearance changed and moved, like looking at a person before he changed, without being hidden by chakra smoke, and the body of the board became so one with its surroundings that it could only be seen if a person was nearby. Mole slowly pulled the wheel back with her strong grip to show that it was still connected to the spinning whirlpool of seals, which was now becoming less visible so she could see in front of her. The strong wind underneath them tried to flip the board over, but the pilot's strong grip kept it from happening. The board rose into the air with a deep whooshing sound as it lifted off the ground and floated into the sky. There was a soft pinging sound, which meant they were high enough to fly comfortably. Mole pressed her feet down a little, and the board full of shocked people shot off in a burst of wind and super suppressed blue fire towards wave country. Having Naruto. He could hear birds singing beautifully, and when he got a whiff of lavender and ramen, he scrunched up his nose. The boy sighed, afraid of what he would see when he opened his eyes. He was especially worried because he could feel strange grass tickling his bare feet and because his head was on someone's lap and they were slowly running their fingers through his hair, as if they were washing away all his worries and it was working, which scared the boy even more. Naruto took a deep breath in and slowly let it out, building up the courage to open his eyes. His bright purple eyes met his sky blue eyes right away. His pale face was smooth and his smile was soft. A familiar face -up. The woman kept running her fingers through his hair, which made him sigh with pleasure and close his eyes to calm down. The woman laughed, and her voice sounded like music to him, so she stopped combing his hair. You can't stay asleep forever, Naruto. The boy made a grumpy sound. But I want to. He turned on her lap so that his right cheek was on her thigh. He looked up at her with childishly big eyes, still trying to remember who she was and why she was in his mind. She let him look at her in silence, taking in every detail. Her happy eyes were purple. Her moon pale skin. Her red painted, small, pouty lips. Her delicate nose. The red hair that fell down her head and gathered around her. When he took another breath, he was hit with the smell of ramen, which was stronger than the lavender. Then it all made sense. Moma? He got up slowly, with wide open eyes. They started to rain, and as she nodded, a few drops fell. Kashina Uzumaki smiled big and opened her arms. Naruto jumped to her as soon as he could and hugged her as tight as he could, crying quietly into her neck. The redhead slowly nodded and rubbed the back of his head, telling him to let out all the things he had been holding in. The roof. White lotus flower abandoned hotel. Sanagakure. Your brother is doing very well. Gara, the case cage, said to Itachi Uchiha, the other man standing next to him. Much better than when the copy ninja taught him on his own. They watched as the youngest Uchiha used chakra on his feet to stay still as sand and wind blew around him in a blizzard. Even though the wind was blowing, the boy closed his eyes and squatted down to stay put. He dug his hands deep into the sand and spread his chakra through it, but he never moved his body. This kept him rooted to the ground. Chakra doesn't just cover the bottoms of his feet. Instead, it spreads out under him like tree roots. A trick he learned from Naruto. Sasuke made the right choice when he decided to wear the clothes of a regular Sanagakure resident. He wore black pants with tape at the ankles to keep sand out and a long-sleeved red shirt with tape at the wrists. The boy wrapped a light brown turban around his head, covering everything except his eyes. This kept his mouth and nose safe from the heat and sand. On the Uchiha's advice, Sakura wore a similar outfit behind him. The only difference was that she didn't cover her whole head. Instead, she had a thick, bright yellow scarf wrapped around her mouth and nose. The end of the scarf flapped around her in a strange way. Sai didn't want to listen, so he only wore a short-sleeved black shirt instead of his usual midriff shirt. The sand was hurting his arms and face, but he didn't care. The team stood back to back and looked for signs of movement in the thick blizzard. Sasuke's three Tomo Sharingan picked up a chakra signature that was blurred by the wind. He counted to three and then pointed forward. Sakura took this as a sign and brought her right fist back and smashed it into the ground. 
From her fist to where her Uchiha teammate had pointed, the sand broke up and the ground cracked open. The genin who made the blizzard stumbled for a moment, but that was all it took for Sai to shoot three ink arrows from his sketchbook that hit the attacker in the stomach and left arm. Sasuke threw a kanai in what looked like an arbitrary direction and did a few hand seals. Body flicker technique. His dujutsu kept track of where his blade went, and he switched with it instantly, slamming his fist into the face of a different genin when that genin tried to slap the blade away. The trick Sasuke used wouldn't have worked without his Sharingan. This time, Kakashi was the one who taught him how to do it. He dug his hands into the sand under him and ignored the genin he had just punched out. Instead, he pulled out from under the sand the last genin who had tried to ambush him. He made the boy look straight into his eyes and said. Sharingan. Genjutsu sleep. The person he was holding went limp and fell asleep in fits and starts. Itachi pursed his lips at how rough his younger brother was being, but he had to admit that it worked. Team 7's undisputed leader was Sasuke. This wasn't because he knew more than the others, but because he put himself in that position and the others didn't question it. Most likely because Sakura still cared about the Uchiha and Sai was less active than everyone thought. The Uchiha outcast had to agree that Naruto, for his age, was a good teacher. Even though Kakashi was strong and smart, it seems that Sasuke wanted to be like the young blonde. Sasuke still wasn't sure about Itachi, but he always remembered what Naruto had taught him in Naruto's personal training area all those months ago. The younger Sharingan user reluctantly told his older brother how Naruto trained him, especially when it came to his changed cursed seal and the Sharingan, which was Kakashi's job at the time. During his training, he had to wear weights, just like the wave genin and the other students of Naruto. Sometimes they had to stand on reinforced needles and go through each hand seal without using chakra. This was a hard task because they had to use chakra to keep the needles from poking their feet, but they couldn't use chakra to get through the hand seals. This was done to speed up their seals and give them more control over different parts of their bodies with their chakra. When Itachi asked if Naruto could even do those exercises, Sasuke said that before they had to do anything, their blonde teacher would do it first to show them how it should be done. It made people wonder when Naruto learned all of his skills and how he could get so strong so quickly. The first thing that came to mind was that he was a prodigy. To a lesser extent, the Uzumaki was a prodigy, but only when it came to Fuinjutsu. Naruto could make seals by drawing on a surface with his chakra. Since he was a level 8, he didn't need an ink pot and brush, but he still used them out of habit. When they were talking about him going back to work in Konoha, Tsunade told him that Naruto had told her that he always had ideas for seals and that he always had shadow clones studying them and getting better at what they did while he focused on running his country and making his alliances stronger. Itachi thought Naruto was strong because another thing, his shadow clones. At this point, it was clear that Naruto had one of the top five largest chakra reserves in all of the elemental nations. This was because he was an Uzumaki and a Jinchuriki. Only a little more than half of his reserves could be used up by making thousands of shadow clones, but that was still enough for him to stay awake. Itachi told the Hokage that the clones could study what Naruto didn't have time to study, which made the Hokage just as confused as Itachi. The woman stood still, thinking about what he said. Then she nodded, but also shook her head. It was true that Naruto used thousands of clones to study scrolls and improve his chakra control by doing advanced exercises that had been forgotten for a long time but were still very effective now. However, shadow clones didn't have muscle memory. Naruto had to do the exercises himself to get his body stronger. Itachi was a logical person who didn't believe in things that couldn't be proven by science. But when it came to Naruto, he didn't understand, so the Hokage took pity on him and explained why Naruto went straight to the top. Determination. Tsunade Senju said without shame that Naruto could take her down easier and more quickly than when they first met in Tanzuki Town because of everything he had learned and mastered. The boy was not only determined to do well, but he was also burning to do better. To beat the Sandame's expectations that he would fail and be weak. In a way, Hiruzen Serutobi had set Naruto on the path he was now on. But now, it wasn't just because he wanted to show the dead cage how strong he was. It was also because an entire island country looked to him for protection and leadership, five small villages looked to him to contribute equally as well as pull his own weight, and a separate group of people, not just his students but also those he had shown his strength to, like Nagato, Konan, Tsunade, Tamari, and others, looked to him for guidance and competence. Naruto was strong because of this. Team 7 looked at the sand team while they were sleeping and found a hand-sized square of paper with the kanji for, fire, on it. 
The Uchiha threw the paper to Sai, who folded it up and put it in his sketchbook. He then waved for his teammates to follow him as he ran quickly to another part of Suna that was broken down and empty. I wouldn't expect anything less from a Naruto student. Gara said it with ease and then looked at Itachi. What do you think? How do you think Sasuke did? Sasuke did okay. He said it in a stony voice. Gara's corner of his mouth turned up for a split second. You were angry at Naruto because he beat you. The Uchiha did not say anything. Itachi, your silence only backs up what I think. The S came in at Uchiha gave a slight shake of the head and said. I don't have anything bad to say about Naruto because he beat me. As another team came up to their observation post, he crossed his arms and turned on his Sharingan. Hanada Hayuga, Naruto's first student, had dark purple hair and pale eyes with a spider web of veins around them. They were closely followed by Kiba Inazuka and Akamaru, and then by Shino Aburame. They were hot on the trail of another team, which was led by Hanada, another one of Naruto's students. Shino covered their backs with a few scout beetles that flew around them and hid themselves about 15 feet away. Soon after, they went by without any problems, and Itachi turned off his Sharingan before going on. I don't like Naruto because he couldn't beat me. Oh yeah, now I remember. M and Frog beat you. I heard they were high-ranking shinobi in Wave, so it's not surprising they beat you. The Uchiha held back and didn't attack. They used one of Naruto's seals against me. If they hadn't, they wouldn't have had a chance. He closed his eyes and brought his ego back under control. Gara agreed with that, but he also said. I agree that you would have been a bigger challenge without the reverse Sharingan seal, but I'm sure you didn't know that both of them had chakra high seals. Itachi asked the K's cage a lot of questions about what the chakra high seal was before Konkuro and Tamari jumped onto the building they were on with a raven perched on Temari's left elbow and a small scroll tied to its left leg. Lord Gara, a message from Wave. Gara didn't care about the title, because if he had, he would have told her again that she and her brother didn't have to call him, Lord. He took the scroll from her outstretched hand and opened it where Itachi couldn't see. He looked at the urgent letter and, with a small frown on his face, spoke to the Uchiha. You need to go to Wave right away. The order reminded him of what he had to do now that he was a Konoha ninja. He could never be a real Konoha ninja again, not after killing most of his clan and getting a bad reputation as an S-ranked ninja all over the continent. No leaf ninja had enough faith in him to let him lead them on missions or even join them. That much was clear, and that's why he had to move around Konoha in a Sharingan Henge so he wouldn't be stopped from going places. Because of this, the Senju Hokage made him Konoha's ambassador to Wave Country, and the Fire Daimyo backed him up. She did this for two reasons. First, it was a requirement of the Konoha Wave Alliance in Konoha's favor, just like it was for any other major village that was allied with Wave. Second, Itachi was a pariah in the village. Tamari was an ambassador for Suna. Ao was an ambassador for Kiri, and now Itachi was an ambassador for Konoha. It was also the other way around, but instead of just Wave sending an ambassador, the Alliance sent an ambassador to each major village they allied with. Smaller villages sent representatives who just reported there and stayed for a few weeks before going back. Ambassadors could only stay for a maximum of six months before they had to apply to go back to their own villages. Back to the present, Itachi had to follow the order to go back to Wave because he wanted to do a good job of representing Konoha. He didn't like it because when he first met Naruto, the boy was very calm, which was very different from when he met him in Tanzuki town. It could have been that he had guards stationed around the room, but it could also have been that the boy was sure he could beat him. He didn't like it, but there was nothing he could do about it. Naruto was better. Itachi gave a nod, and Kamui went to Wave country by teleporting. General Hospital. Wave Central. Wave Country. There was a buzz in the hospital as both new and experienced doctors rushed around. As they got ready for their leader to come to the hospital, their feet slid on the marble floors. The rooms of the patients were checked over and over again to impress their leader, and a group of five medics, including Hoshi, Marsh, and Wave Medics, rushed to the east wing of the hospital, where people were being treated for chakra poison and infections. As soon as they got to the last room, which had a view of the whole country, the squad leader started barking out orders. They started to worry about every little thing, straightening bedsheets, fluffing pillows, triple-checking the medicine cabinet, and cross-checking the seals on the walls. When they were done, they were told to come back that evening, when their leader was expected to arrive on a seal board flight. Until then, they were to make sure the other patients stayed calm and didn't know what was going to happen. 
The head matron was among them. She was in charge of the 10-person medical team and was a fat woman with long gray hair. She was wearing the Wave senior medic uniform, which was a blue apron dress with short sleeves, black trousers and a white cap that said, Medic, in kanji. She was in her late 50s and had been a Marsh Kunoichi for a long time. The woman sat down at her office desk and read the report that Raven, the genjutsu expert, had written quickly about Naruto's health. Most of what it said was that it was a dujutsu trick that couldn't be broken in the usual way. Her apprentice, a small wave kunoichi in her early twenties, shuffled in and gave her more information about the other people being cared for by her staff. The wave leader had made it clear that anyone who wanted to be head matron of the hospital had to be an experienced medic ninja and not a regular person. Since the wave apprentice was the best in her class and had impressed her enough to be taken under her wing, she planned to give the title to her. The marsh woman was the last person from a other village to be in charge of a wave department. The water and electricity departments were taken over by wave-born people and Hoshi clan members, respectively. Wave citizens were already running the civilian and shinobi schools, either a Hoshi or someone born in wave, and the library was back in wave's control. Those who quit their jobs were given permanent housing in outer wave and were paid retirement benefits for their work, but only if they quit working for their departments on their own. If they didn't, they were still paid salaries. The matron had her own house in outer wave. It was a one-story apartment with the best furniture and cooking tools that money could buy. There, her grandchildren came to see her, but only with their parents, since they were still too young to go out on their own. She only saw Naruto at council meetings and when she had to give a monthly report on what was going on at the hospital. Despite being young, he was able to keep up with whatever she threw at him. Thirty minutes before the wave leader was due to arrive, a woman heard a soft knock at her door, and Itachi Uchiha stuck his head in. Yes. You're supposed to wait in room 40 of the chakra poison and infection ward. You can go there with my apprentice. She gave him a nod, and Okami, her apprentice, got up to leave. Yes, sensei. They walked up the stairs and moved aside when several groups of dark shinobi ran up to the roof, where they heard a loud thump. The apprentice was worried and thought the worst until Itachi put his hand on her shoulder and shook her out of it. When they got to the room, Okami politely pointed to Itachi and told him to stand to the left of the hospital bed, away from the window. Everyone knew that Naruto liked to look out the window at Wave Country. People were running through the halls and stomping, and the door to the room flew open with a loud bang. Okami didn't let out a shocked gasp when they brought Naruto in on his floating wheelchair while he was asleep. The big matron also came in with a stomp and sent everyone out except the four medics she had chosen to care for the leader. Mole fussed as she was pushed out of the room, insisting that her place was next to her master. She was finally let back in after she reminded them very loudly that her job as deputy dark commander was more important than her job as head matron. The older woman was about to refuse treatment to the blonde teen when Mole said those words, especially since Mole had also brought Raven in. However, she changed her mind when Mole took off her mask and quietly thanked her, her hazel eyes drooping with sadness. The woman started giving orders to the other four medics, one of whom was her apprentice. She told them to connect Naruto to the heart monitor and make sure his neck wasn't in an uncomfortable position while she clicked a button on a remote to lift his upper body slightly, like he was sitting back in a chair. The standard antidote for chakra poisoning was right next to them, but with a genjutsu, it was almost useless. The matron watched as the medical staff took his vital signs and wrote them down on two different clipboards. Both of these clipboards would be kept in her office. When they had all the information they needed, they slowly and hesitantly moved out of the way so Itachi could get closer to the bed. Mole's right hand shot forward and grabbed his left wrist. She was quiet for a few short seconds before she whispered. Can you help him? He didn't look at her. Instead, he kept his eyes on Naruto as his Sharingan merged with itself and began to spin quickly, becoming the evolved Sharingan. I'll try to see what I can do. Having Naruto. The boy wanted to know so many things. The words came out of his mouth so quickly that they were mostly a mix of sounds and wild hand movements. Kashina put her hand over her mouth and laughed. He stopped when his face turned red. Oh, honey, you are just too cute. She smiled and pinched both of his cheeks, pulling them out, then snapping them back. Naruto grimaced and rubbed his cheeks, which hurt. But but Buddha I'd like to. You want to ask questions, and you want to ask a lot of questions. She cut him off, and when he nodded, she gently tapped him on the nose. His face turned red again, making him feel even worse about how weak he was acting. 
Naruto sat back on his haunches and idly noticed that he was wearing black shorts and a deep blue short-sleeved shirt. He rubbed his exposed arms in a self-conscious way, especially when she looked at his tattooed shirt sleeve, which went all the way down to his wrists. She frowned, and he scratched the back of his head in a cheeky way. He spoke quickly before she could throw fire on his head. What am I doing? What brought you here? How come I'm here? Where are all of my body seals? Strangely enough, he was only left with the tattoos and not the seals. Even though he was yelling at her, he hoped that his questions would drown out what she was going to say about his tattoos. She stared at him with narrowed eyes for a full minute. When she shuffled forward and sat back down on her behind, it scared him. Before she sighed, her red painted lips were tied to the side and screwed together. Minato also had tattoos, but not as many as you did. I didn't really like them, but I guess he had them since he was a genin, which was before we started dating. She put her hands on his shoulders shakily, making him wince when she accidentally squeezed them. He calmed down a moment later, though, when she had calmed down. This is a happy time. I can't waste it by yelling at my son. A small smile grew on her face, and Naruto's face also smiled. Let's see, in order, you are in your head, I'm not your mother. I'm just the physical form of the chakra she put in the containment seal in case something like this happened. Daku put you under a Sharingan deep sleep illusion, and the effects of the illusion destroyed any failsafe seals or jutsu you made. The painful truth that she wasn't his real mother made his head drop. Then he realized something that scared him out of his almost depressive state. But that means, he slowly made his eyes bigger, and she nodded. Your seal tree is now gone. His seal tree did more than just control his chakra. It also safely stored Kyubi's chakra and a mix of both of their chakras. He added the tree to the Death Reaper seal in his mindscape to make it easier for him to control all the volatile and dangerous chakra that was building up in his body. Kyubi was right, no matter how much Naruto tried to deny it. He wasn't ready to control all that dangerous chakra, including his and Kyubi's combined, by himself, and the containment seal kept the tailed beast from doing much. Naruto's personal well of chakra, which is his own chakra, could be easily taken care of. If the tree broke under pressure, his chakra would seep back into the ground and come back to him. The problem was that once Kyubi's chakra left his body and mixed with the roots of the seal tree, it could only come back if the tree was destroyed. However, if the tree was destroyed, the mixture would go back to Kyubi because the ground would never accept it. This would make Kyubi's tailed beast even more dangerous. The seal master rubbed his head with both hands to try to get rid of the headache that was about to hit him. After that, he put his hands down and asked. What did you mean when you said that things like that happen? The mother of the Uzumaki family proudly flipped her long, beautiful red hair and pouted. This may be hard to believe, but I too have been fooled by a Mangekyo Sharingan deep sleep illusion, it was easier to talk about herself in the first person than to talk about herself in the third. She kept telling herself that it was also more refined for someone of her level. So that's the name. He thought, then rolled his eyes and said in a sarcastic way. No, just to make her laugh. Kashina gave a firm nod. I know exactly what you're thinking. How could your badass mother fall under Genjutsu? He decided to make her laugh again by gasping and putting his hands over his mouth, making it look like she knew what he was thinking. I thought the same thing. What did you do? She used her long finger that was painted purple to tap the side of her head. A mother can tell. Then she got closer and said. Makoto, my best friend in the whole world, once had the Mangekyo herself, and when we were Junin and fighting, she used that stupid illusion on me. Before I could wake up, I had to sleep for three weeks. So I have to be the one to break the spell? Yes, you can, but a Mangekyo user could help you do it faster, maybe in a few days. Damn, Makoto was still mad at me because I called Fugaku a fat jerk. It was right. She yelled and crossed her arms like a child who was upset. I have no regrets. Naruto snapped his fingers right in front of her face. Hey, I need you to pay attention. Even though his first thought about his mother was that she had a big, all-encompassing heart and his second thought was that she had a rage that was almost impossible to control, his third, fourth, or even fifth thought about her was that she was easily distracted, especially by a bad memory. This wasn't even the first time he had to wake her up. Thank goodness he didn't get it from her. Or did Heya? Honey, honey, pull yourself together. Hum? He asked with a hum and rubbed his face in anger. 
It looks like I did. What did you say? Nothing. What did you mean when you talked about shattering the illusion? Yes, I did have to do something to wake myself up. It took me two weeks and a lot of work to figure out what I had to do, but I did it. She stood up, and Naruto did the same. Then she dusted off her casual dress, which was light green and white. She talked while grabbing his hand and pointing to the sun. When they both looked up, Naruto's jaw dropped when he saw that the flaming ball of fire was actually a single flaming red Mangekyo eye that wasn't moving. That eye had to be destroyed. He looked at her with astonishment, and because he was a head taller than her, he had to look down a little bit. You figured that out in three weeks? She punched him in the stomach. The blow was so hard that he fell to his knees and groaned. Don't talk to your mum like she doesn't know anything. Her red hair was all over the place and split into nine different tails. She grabbed his neck and lifted him off his feet. Her dark purple eyes were filled with anger and power she couldn't use. You dare insult me? Her voice was deep with demonic rage. Naruto cut and scratched weakly at her hands, which were gripping his neck like a vice. Ack. Mo m moma i i'm choking. He said, and his blue eyes started to roll back into their sockets. Her purple eyes went from being angry to being kind, and she quickly let go of him, apologizing a lot as the boy massaged his sore neck and he painfully took deep breaths. As the boy tried not to die, she gently massaged his back and said soothing words. That's it, breathe, breathe, breathe. She was acting like she wasn't the one who would have killed him if she had kept her hands on his neck for a few seconds longer. If Naruto didn't have a deep fear of being attacked, he would have pushed his mother away. Even though he stumbled to his feet and limped away from her, the woman smiled as she followed him, skipping after him with her hands clasped behind her. I apologize. She laughed at him and grabbed his shoulder. Oh honey, stop being so dramatic, it didn't hurt that much. Naruto's face turned red, and he barely stopped himself from yelling at her. How how? He choked on his words. He pointed at the eye and asked, how do I get up there? That's it. I knew you were like me. Or like her. You know what I mean. She quickly ignored his angry hiss and kicked a stone away for no reason. To do that, you have to work with Kayubi, and before you can do that, you have to beat him into submission. I need to. Kayubia, the ground shook and the sun darkened in an ominous way. The wild roar of the strongest tailed beast echoed through the air and pierced their ears, sending shivers down their spines at the sheer power and bloodlust in the single animalistic thunder. A person's weakest point is, of course, when he or she is sleeping. This is more than just saying that the body doesn't know everything about its immediate and distant surroundings. It also has to do with the mind. The brain was resting going over what had happened that day, and putting things in long-term memory in order. Dreams were just reenactments of subconscious memories. If you look into them closely, you'll see that they really did happen to you to some degree. 97% of the brain's energy went to keeping the body alive while the person was asleep. It did this by telling the heart to beat and the different organs to do whatever needed to be done. When the person was awake, the brain had time and energy to fight mental attacks. Shinobi were taught to sleep lightly so that even small sounds that didn't seem important would wake them up. They were trained again to stay awake as long as possible, but lack of sleep was still the number one cause of shinobi deaths, so sleeping was a natural part of being a human, shinobi or not. People like Naruto, who were Jinchuriki, were always fighting to keep their beasts from taking over their minds, whether the beasts wanted to take over or not. Take Kayubi, for example. Kurama was very friendly with Naruto, and the tailed beast's biggest fear was that Naruto would die. This wasn't because he thought he would die, too, he would come back to life a few years later, but because he wanted Naruto to live a safe and happy life. Even though Kayubi was in charge of his chakra, it would still attack Naruto's mind while he slept. The Death Reaper seal helped in the battle for total control, but it only created a buffer zone that shielded Naruto from the chakra of the tailed beasts for a short time. When the zone started to break down, Naruto was exposed to the chakra of the tailed beasts again. The only known way to stop these mental attacks was for the Jinchuriki to win a mindscape fight and gain complete control over the chakra of his beast. Back to the situation at hand, Naruto had been put into a deep sleep by the eternal Mangekyo Sharingan Genjutsu, which was the strongest sleep-related Genjutsu in the world. This made Naruto much weaker than he had ever been before. Even though he had lost all of his seals and equipment, this was still a dream, not just a mindscape projection, and most importantly, it was Naruto's dream. 
Kashina told Naruto this quickly as they struggled to stay on the ground with each loud step from the nine-tailed fox they still hadn't seen. This is your dream, Naruto. Don't forget that you are the king of your own mind. With each tremor, the grassy plain around them shook and moved. There were no trees or bushes for miles. Naruto was frantically looking around. He had seen this side of Kyubi before, so he took a deep breath, flexed his hands nervously, hunched his back a little, and moved his feet from left to right. When he turned his head back to Kashina, he was surprised to see that she wasn't there, but he could still hear her voice. I believe in you, my child. Good luck. Then, miles ahead of him, Kyubi's beautiful nine tails shot out of the ground and swayed hypnotically in the dreamscape's light breeze. Then, the tailed beast's terrifying head erupted from the ground, destroying the earth and making clumps of dirt fall from the sky. Karama looked at Naruto straight in the eyes and grinned. Country wave. They had to make sure no one found out what had happened to Naruto and, it seems, now Daku. People in wave country knew that their leader had come back, and some of them were eager to see him because they had appointments with him, but they couldn't get into the leader's tower for some strange reason. Quickly, a leader had to be chosen to take over as wave leader and keep things looking good until Naruto got his title back. Since Daku was nowhere to be found, and since he had Naruto's chakra, it was clear that both he and his master would be affected by the genjutsu, the next in line should be chosen as the leader in the meantime. They were either a mole or a frog. Frog because he was the closest to the wave leader's office. He was also known to be close to the blonde seal master and was a good ninja on his own. Mole because she was the second in command of the dark and worked right under Daku. She was also in charge of Naruto's bodyguards. Mole took the respected role instead of Frog because she was the strongest person in the country at the time, and everyone, whether they were Hoshi or Wave, respected her a lot. The short-haired woman with brown hair sat down in Naruto's seat. Her face was straight, and she didn't show that she was nervous. She put her hands on his desk, tied them together, and put them under her chin as she looked around the room at Frog, Zabuza, Haku, the Demon Brothers, Tamari, Naruto's personal guards, and Hoshi Kira Pinzetsu, the leader of the Hoshi clan. The Suna Kunoichi had rushed back to Wave to find out why Itachi had been called back while the clan head had been called because he would be involved in decisions about their leader. In this situation, as in the past, our top priority is to keep the people from finding out about Lord Naruto's condition. She said something, and her words echoed through the room, which was dead quiet. Even Zabuza, who was standing and carrying his huge cleaver on his back, gave a short nod. The new boss kept going. His hospital room will be watched around the clock. Raven, you're in charge of the team now, so go. They gave a salute and then walked out of the room. Haku, I want you to call back all of the hunter ninjas who are outside of the island and send them to the guard towers. I want you, Zabuza, to help him make sure that the security seals on all Jinchuriki who are allies of the wave are still in place. As a side job, I want you to make sure that the barrier seals on all alliance villages are still in place, starting here. Zabuza wasn't the best at seals, he left that to Naruto and Haku, but he was great at memorizing, cramming. He had to remember how to stack the seals in the right way to make a barrier seal and a security seal. Both seals were level 9 and so hard to understand that a normal man's brain would burn if he tried to figure them out. But Zabuza wasn't trying to figure them out. He was just trying to remember them. The barrier seal had been explained many times. It was an all-elemental defense and detection seal that could stop and contain any attack known to man, including nature chakra attacks, as long as the chakra battery, which came from a room under the leader's tower, was working. The security seal wasn't supposed to fail. Naruto put his hands on the holders of the one, six, seven, and nine tails. The three tails hadn't yet come back together. The seal was made up of a chakra control destruction seal, a Sharingan destruction seal, reverse Sharingan seal, an alarm seal, a reverse summoning seal that would bring the Jinchuriki to a sealed room in their own villages, and a watered-down version of the Chakra High that would activate if the Jinchuriki's chakra was drained. Naruto was always very cautious. Zabuza could still learn Fuenjutsu. All he had to do was take a class on how to teach it, and after a few years of regular study, he would be a level 3, but he wasn't that patient. He did what Naruto told him to do, and thank goodness the boy didn't force him to learn seals. Zabuza sighed at all the missions he was given, but he still saluted, even though he didn't want to, and he and Haku left. Frog, you are now in charge of Dark for the time being, but you still need to help me in this office. 
Along with these two jobs, you will also be in charge of four major construction projects, as you have been in the past. Frog nodded and took the armband of Dark Commander from Mole. He and Mole gave each other grim nods, and then Frog saluted sharply and left. Mole had mentioned four major construction projects that were still going on. The first was the Wave Country Chunin Exam Stadium, a huge building made of solid stone and iron, with seals supporting each block. It was being built in outer wave, on a flat piece of free land not too close to wave central's walls. Frog thought that the work would be done in another month if they kept going at the same speed. The second building was actually 13 smaller guard posts that were being built off the island on the half circle of land that used to be fire country but was now Naruto's land because his parents bought it. The land that was too far away from wave was sold back to the daimyo, and the money went back into wave's growing bank account. About 10 miles later, the trees and bushes got thicker, which was a clear sign that they were now in fire country, but not yet in Konoha. The guard posts were almost done being built, but Naruto told them they still needed to be painted and covered in a Fuin Genjutsu. Hunter ninjas went to these buildings when they were in too much of a hurry to get into wave. This is also where the guard ninjas and guard rotation were stationed, just outside of wave's detection barrier. Because the land outside the island country was so big, there were 13 buildings. At least three miles separated each guard post. The third building being worked on was actually an upgrade for the headquarters of the dark operatives. With the number of operatives rising that month, sleeping quarters were being built in the building, and the mess hall was getting bigger. A lot of work was being done to make sure that each ninja had a place to stay, and there were many rooms dug underground to train or develop the operatives in ways that had nothing to do with being a shinobi. Thankfully, the people who started building the HQ were smart enough to leave room for growth both above and below ground. Even though there were other jobs being done, they were mostly by citizens who were working on their farms and businesses. The last big construction job was again just a chain of buildings being built outside of Wave Central, where there was a lot of free land because the country's walls were so big. Not that there wasn't a lot of space inside the walls, but the young leader had decided, for the sake of order and organization in his country, that buildings inside the walls should be for businesses, schools, and organizations closely linked with his office that could only be maintained from a reachable distance, like schools and dark HQ, while outer wave was for farmland, fish markets, training grounds, clan competitions, and clan homes. The building Naruto was building fell into the last category. It was building a place for kids, teens, and older people to have fun. There were already buildings for people inside the inner walls, but a few parents who liked living near water asked for the new buildings. The blonde leader gave in to their pleading, but they still had to go to school in Inner Wave, which was becoming more and more like a city. Mole looked at the last person in the room, a tall man with white hair that reached his shoulders and was pulled back into a ponytail. He was wearing a royal purple cloak with slits down the sides that showed his black ninja trousers and black sandals. This was probably his combat uniform. He stood with his hands behind his back and his head held high, waiting for the leader to tell him what to do. Kira Pinzetsu I don't want your clan members to find out about Lord Naruto's situation, and I'm sure you know why. The man clenched his teeth but nodded in silence. Understood. And, she said next, pointing at him as he was getting ready to leave the room. As chief of police, I want there to be more police patrols around the island, both on the inner wave and the outer wave. I have a feeling that whoever killed our lord will soon attack, and I want this country to be completely safe, barrier seal or not. He gave a nod and waited for more orders. I won't tell you what to do. Lady M, I will do everything I can to keep Wave safe. I believe you. She made a sign for him to leave, and when he didn't, she raised an eyebrow. Does something seem wrong? I need to know when the new tools Lord Naruto ordered to be made will arrive so I can start teaching my men how to use them. Mole moved some papers around on her desk until she found what she needed. Lord Chensomoka, the leader of the smoke, said that they will come first thing tomorrow morning. She hummed and turned the page to see a picture of what Naruto had asked the mechanic and engineer in the blessed allied village to make for him, a baton. This one was almost the same as the one Daku used to fight, but it was made of a lighter metal. People in the allied village were getting seals more often, so it wasn't surprising that the baton was covered in seals. The functions were written out in another letter, but in general, it could completely disable a person with a single tap, as long as a few conditions were met. Those conditions were also written out elsewhere. The other village's police forces, not the shinobi force, were supposed to get the weapons. She said as she gave the picture to the man. They'll take the train and get there tomorrow at first light. Many thanks, Lady M. 
He said it in a humble way and bowed low. He left the room after she said yes. The woman rolled her eyes and got ready to do the next part of her job. Naruto had planned out what would happen if he couldn't do his job. The first step was to hide the fact that he couldn't do his job so that Wave wouldn't panic. The second step was to call back about half of the ninjas to the village. This was because many people wanted his head and were willing to go through people to get him. Once everything was settled, he would lessen the urgency and only call back much less than half of his forces. The leader pushed the intercom button on her desk, and the civilian secretary came in right away. She gave the scroll to the civilian secretary, who read it, nodded silently, and went to do what was written. Next, she had to make sure that everything went on as usual. That was the last thing on her list, so she could now cross it off. She heard a low, polite cough, and the pale former root agent blushed a little when she remembered that Tamari was still in the office. I'm sorry, Lady Tamari. I just had a lot on my mind right now. Suna Kunoichi, who was blonde, gave a careless wave. What is it you want me to do? Mole drummed her fingers on her desk and said. Could you please train Lord Naruto's genin team instead? She tapped her fingers on the table, and a cloud of chakra smoke came out of her body. When the smoke cleared, she could see a finely detailed henge of Naruto. Can you, as my lord Naruto, also judge my henge? So that's it for today, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel for more awesome stories like this. Thank you, see you all in my next video.